Uh, hi, thank you, um, Eric, for that introduction. Thank you, Ian, uh, for inviting me and the OpenStreetMap US board, the volunteers um, here, uh, all of the staff at the McNamara Center. My dad went to U of M, um, which I always forget until I'm in Minneapolis. Uh, and just generally all of the support staff putting together conferences is such an incredible ordeal. Um, I also want to um, thank two people who aren't here. Um, Charlie Lloyd was willing to talk to me on the phone for like a good 45 minutes uh, a few weeks ago when I was like, Charlie, I have to give this talk and I haven't been to a state of the map since like 2014, uh, what do I do? Um, and also uh, a quick shout out to Aaron Straub Cope who um, did nothing uh, for this talk, but often when I'm not sure what to do, I think, what, what would Aaron Straub Cope do in this situation? Um, that, that might be kind of the energy of this talk. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be here. I haven't really been super active in the, the New York OpenStreetMap community for a few years. Oh, one more thank you. Um, I wanted to thank Kevin uh, for his keynote yesterday because it led to me completely rewriting my talk all of yesterday, which is why I went to no sessions. Um, you know, I thought to myself, well, that was a really great presentation about a super local context and a really clear articulation of the role of mapping in something. And I was like, how about the opposite of that? I will do the opposite of that. Um, this is drawn a little bit from some ideas I've been toying with and spoken about in a couple of their talks last winter. So if you happened to see me somewhere else, I apologize in advance for any repetition. Um, so let's start with Mars. Uh, so for those who don't spend a lot of time reading extremely dense science fiction, Red Mars is part of a trilogy of books written by Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, that explore the environmental and political consequences of terraforming Mars over a century plus period of time. Um, I should confess, I did not actually finish the trilogy. I got halfway through Blue before I got very angry at um, uh, arguably minor world building detail and said a swear word and threw the book across the room. Um, apparently, I can put up with a lot of things, but when you put birds, which have hollow bones, into a thin, atmospheric environment like Mars, that is my, that's my bridge too far. Um, but I think the, uh, the extent of my ambivalence about uh, those books demonstrates the, you know, they at least they've stayed with me. And there is a character in this particular kind of moment in, in Red Mars that I've been thinking a lot about the past year. Um, so Anne Claiborne is a character in, in the book. She is a geologist and she is uh, firmly against terraforming Mars. Um, it's not much of a spoiler to tell you that she does not get her way in the end. Um, and in a way, she had already lost the second she landed on the planet. Um, more on that later. But there's this moment early in, in the book where she, she's, another character is sort of trying to reassure her that like, Terraforming is like a good idea because Mars is like inherently an unsafe environment for humans. And she says, yeah, we'll all say that. We'll all go on and make the place safe. Roads, cities, new sky, new soil, until it's, it's all some kind of Siberia or Northwest territories and Mars will be gone and we'll be here and we'll wonder why we feel so empty. Why, when we look at the land, we can never see anything but our own faces. And this phrase really stuck with me for a while because the, the sentiment of looking at the land and only seeing one's own face is, is a really good way to articulate the kind of entitlement and blitheness of what colonialism and capitalism do to land and, and by extension to all of the living things that inhabit it, right? It's looking at a place and seeing resources to be expropriated to look at a population and see bodies to be enslaved or intellectual property to be copyrighted by the pharmaceutical industry, capital to be transformed into profit. Uh, I have a hard time explaining what I do sometimes. Um, people seem to understand if I say that I do art and, and journalism. And as an artist and a journalist, I, I think what I, I tend to do is, is try to find different ways to look at land. Uh, for the last few years in the work that I guess got me invited to give this talk, um, as focused on how communication infrastructure inhabits land. I guess I, I tend to get really interested in systems and landscapes that, that might be perceived as being easily taken for granted. Uh, taking something for granted can be defined in, in two ways, right? Um, it can mean being careless with or unappreciative of something, 
or assuming that something is true or correct without any question. Looking at land and only seeing one's own face could also be thought about in those terms, maybe. Um, and I used to think, oh, I had to get it to play, that's important. I used to think that I got interested in things that get taken for granted because um, of a kind of impulse to like root for the underdog, right? Like this thing that, that maybe doesn't get appreciated, appreciated, but I think, you know, a lot of the systems that I spend time looking at are tremendously powerful. And I, I think actually the appeal of underdog narratives is that they let people pretend that they don't have power. Um, power is something that I think is actually taken for granted most of all. People can be very careless with and unobservant of their own power. And uh, in my experience, um, people, usually men, really don't like it when you tell them they have power. Um, and you know, there's an assumption that that it will be work a certain way and always has and um, always will. Maps and infrastructure are both very significant vectors for exercising power and they're both examples of things that tend to get taken for granted, both in terms of carelessness and in terms of unquestioned acceptance. Um, if you don't, you know, if you're outside of the industries that work with these things, they, you know, you've generally probably been socialized to forget about them until something goes wrong, right? Like, maybe you don't think about the road until there's a pothole in it. Maybe you don't think about electricity until there's an outage. Um, you don't think about the map until you're irrevocably lost. And with communications infrastructure, you might not think of the cloud as a series of buildings in specific places around the world until uh, uh, there's like a power outage somewhere in Virginia and your S3 bucket isn't loading and the images won't load in Slack and all this other stuff stops working and it's really annoying and you're just, your day is kind of like screwed um, and your productivity goes way down. Um, sometimes that's good. <laughs> so I've done a lot of work writing about those different buildings. Um, in 2015, I like kind of was living out of a pickup truck and I drove around America visiting some of those places and writing about what some of those places are like and people seem to like it. I, um, I did some work with my friend Surya Matu, developing sort of like teaching tools for uh, explaining internet infrastructure to young adults because that is a piece of digital literacy that has been deemed irrelevant by, by most digital literacy programs. Um, the thing again that I think is the reason I got invited to be here um, is this project which is a field guide to internet infrastructure in New York City. Um, so that, that image might not explain it very clearly what it's doing. There's a lot of just sort of like quotidian things on the street that can give you some indication of where the internet is in, in public space. Um, so the example in that page spread happens to be like spray painted utility markings. So um, those are all color coded for street excavation purposes. Um, and you can actually kind of figure out a lot of things about the way the internet moves through a space by just looking at what's been left behind uh, by street construction. This is um, markings indicating uh, fiber optic cables owned by, well, level three communications got bought by CenturyLink, but whatever. Um, somewhere, I think this is in like the financial district. Uh, and then in 2016, I published a sort of revised, expanded version of this with Melville House. The first one was sort of a like personal art project. Um, it frequently entertains me that in uh, New York City bookstores, this, this book frequently ends up in the New York tour guides section. Like, I, I really want to know which tourist sees this and is like, yes, this is what I came here for. Um, and I think it was, I kind of was surprised <laughs> that I got invited to, to speak at this conference because I kind of went out of my way with that work to not really have maps. Um, there are some illustrations of specific carrier hotels, like footprints of buildings in, in New York City. But aside from the fact that like, part of this is born, a project was born out of the fact that there aren't public maps of fiber optic cable routes in New York City, um, I wasn't really interested in giving readers a, a God's eye view of this stuff. Um, Networks of New York tries to give people a way to look at the land and landscape differently, not necessarily in order to make a map, like you can if you want to, I don't really care, um, but really to just be attentive to their immediate surroundings in a different way. Like learning how to read utility markings, in, in my experience both of learning it and teaching it to other people, like really does transform the way that you look at like an intersection. It's kind of astonishing just thinking about how much labor and stuff goes into making 
spaces work. Um, and also was sort of this sideways way to introduce people to sort of bigger systemic stuff that via sort of tangible artifacts that they might see in their day-to-day -day life, right? Like so, you know, um, like the, the people working in, you know, telecommunications manholes that you might ignore, like who are those people? What, what companies do they work for? Like why doesn't anyone thank them? Um, or like license plate readers on the backs of NYPD cars, what's a license plate reader? What is the system network to? Why, why do the police exist? Um, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and you know, when I first did this project, a lot of people asked if I'd thought about, um, or told me I should, because people love to tell me what to do. Um, if I, if I would make an app to like crowdsource this, right? Like, oh, we can just like do GPS traces of all of the spray painted markings and then we'll know where the fiber roots are and it'll be great. Um, and I, aside from the fact that that wasn't really what the field guide was designed to do, um, I am not good at community management. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to like try to do that and then six months later have some sort of like ghost shell of a crowdsourcing project haunting the internet, like so many like Ushahidi instances um, around the world. Uh, so I was really grateful uh, a couple years ago when uh, two projects kind of leveraged OpenStreetMap and did this so I didn't have to. Um, so Russ Garrett made Open InfraMap, which is the one on the right. Sorry, those are so small. Um, and Amber Fried Jimenez, Ben Dalton, Joe Damon, and Tim Waters worked on New Cloud Atlas, which is on the, the right. Um, and both basically utilize OSM's existing resources for infrastructure mapping to surface data about, in Open InfraMap's case, uh, utilities writ large and in New Cloud Atlas, telecommunications infrastructure. Um, and they, they were really clever, right? Because they sidestepped the challenge of community management um, by basically just being visualizations of work that is already happening in OSM and kind of being an invitation to expand or continue that work. Like if you find this interesting, maybe you could con you know, keep doing it. And you know, they're kind of, they're limited in some ways by what is actually publicly available about this stuff. Um, although in communications uh, infrastructure, I think since Google and Facebook and large companies like that have sort of realized that their data centers can become like marketing assets, it's a lot easier to figure out where they are. Um, but they're also sort of limited just because, I mean, it's called open street map. Um, OSM was not really designed for subsurface systems. And there's a lot of things about subsurface systems that are really complex to map when you take into account all of the other features that have to be considered you know, for taking care of them, right? Like, depth is one, sure. Um, but like, also like, what is the material the conduit's held in? Uh, like, what is the soil competition? What's the geology surrounding this? Uh, what, what is the proximity of other cables around it? Um, most utility companies don't actually share this information amongst themselves. They're very protective of it. Um, in New York City, there had been efforts in the late 90s to start to really consolidate all of that information to have a really clear portrait of the subsurface conditions under New York City. Then 9-11 happened, and even though having that knowledge was incredibly important for the recovery work, security anxiety really like undermined a lot of the work that had already happened. Um, there, there is an interesting effort in the Open Geospatial Consortium um, to develop sort of an open standard to try and encourage more data sharing, because the other problem is it's like these people aren't using the same systems and models for their subsurface infrastructure. Um, because it is a, an open source standard, it has a, a belabored acronym. Um, in this case, it's called MUDDY, the Model for Underground Data Definition and Integration. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much more about that. I just kind of wanted to acknowledge like there are other models. I think if, um, I don't really think that OpenStreetMap has some obligation to become open subsurface map. Um, and and I, I also wanna kind of reiterate that me not wanting to be responsible for a crowdsourced map is, is not based on opposing the premise of doing it. Um, I think you know a field guide and a global map just do two very different things. Uh, they work at completely different scales. And I guess what, what I've been trying to figure out recently, I guess for the past year, is sort of negotiating those scales to make planetary scale transformations that we currently are living through and which computers have kind of enabled resonate at, at a human scale level, which um, brings us back to Mars um, and to terraforming. Um, I've, I've been finding it kind of useful recently to, to talk about the internet as basically the most ambitious terraforming project ever undertaken by human civilization 
only maybe instead of making the world more inhabitable for, for humans, it's maybe more inhabitable for corporate personhood. Um, Neil Stevenson sort of gestured at this back in 1996 when he wrote Mother Earth Motherboard for Wired Magazine. Um, I had this amazing photo of him that I couldn't find for you, but he's, he's such a clown. Um, I think he was a bit more optimistic about the idea of turning the planet into a giant computer um, than I am. And admittedly, I feel like, I don't know, I think terraforming is, is I'm playing fast and loose, but I think it's a word worthy of reclaiming. I know it's commonly invoked in terms of fictional transformations of non-Earth planets, but you know, it literally just breaks down to Earth's making, right? Which is kind of what the entire dichotomy of nature versus civilization has, has ever been. To be human is to make worlds and to shape and reshape the world we are in. You know, building cities, turning on air conditioners, growing vegetables, recycling paper, all of it in different kind of haphazard ways at different scales reforms the earth in different ways and is about being in relationship to it. Cultures are terraforming technologies. Borders are terraforming technologies. Um, even sort of the, the fiction of like restoring land to some previous natural state is, is a kind of terraforming, a decision being made about what nature should be. And, and infrastructure is kind of, sorry, this is a, just a fun example of how to visualize that terraforming. This is a project I did a couple years ago, making large scale lenticular prints of satellite imagery. Um, this is a Google data center being built over time somewhere outside of Atlanta. Um, Infrastructure is kind of a terraforming instrument par excellence, right? Because it's very visually legible and also very ideologically legible. Um, Joe Goldie uh, is a history scholar and wrote a book called Roads to Power, which documents the development of road networks in Britain in the 1840s, which is much more interesting than you think it's going to be. Um, and she argues that in the process, Britain became an infrastructure state, which in her words is, is when governments regularly designed the flow of bodies, information, and people. And she is not opposed to that project or the idea of infrastructure. She writes, you know, no people in the modern world can flourish without infrastructure, whether village farmers in the mountains, libertarians in wealthy villages, or radicals scattered across many towns, but only a government that reflects their interests equally can design a form of infrastructure that serves them all. And infrastructure is often a manifestation of how it does not serve everyone. Um, Kevin addressed a lot of this really well yesterday, which is convenient, so I don't have to repeat any of it. Um, and it also had, you know, I, I'm glad he mentioned the highways um, because that was the example I wanted to use. Um, around here in, in, over in St. Paul, um, one of the more famous examples of this is how I-94 split apart a neighborhood, um, a predominantly African-American neighborhood named Rondo. Um, and God bless the like open street map contributor who added a note about how like, about this, I think it says like, neighborhood was cut in half by uh, highway development. Like, I'm just glad that that like metadata <laughs> was buried somewhere into this because it makes maybe more sense to attach it to the neighborhood than the entirety of the interstate. Maybe it should be, I don't know. <laughs> um, and you know, like, there was certainly like outrage and organizing and attempts to, you know, stop this this interstate from cutting through this neighborhood at the time. And within Rondo, like it is still talked about. There is like a memorial to the neighborhood, like commemorating this event. And that's sort of another thing about infrastructure. Um, it it is actually only taken for granted by people who benefit from it or by people who don't have to live with um, its consequences, right? If you and I think if you don't take time to look at infrastructure at a ground level, if it's, if it's sort of just tracing from a far zoom, it is a lot easier to understand it as an inevitability rather than as a contested possibility. Um, and I don't really feel like this is an audience that is like, oh yes, maps, not culpable at all in this narrative. Um, you know, it's not a surprise to anyone in this room that maps were kind of crucial to the terraforming uh, with which we live today, um, or that a mentality of looking at the land and seeing only one's own face uh, was kind of drove a lot of the development of cartography tools. Um, the image on the left is of um, the red line, which was uh, Britain's telegraph system for uh, keeping tabs on their colonies. Um, the image on the right is uh, today's uh, submarine cable network uh, for telecommunications. And you can, it's not immediately evident between these two maps, but much of the patterns of how these uh, routes ended up being built out kind of built on top of what the red line began with. Um, I want it, I feel, I don't, this might not go well. Um, 
I mentioned to a few people uh, yesterday that I, I wanted, the thing that's been like on my mind a lot with, like there are millions of examples, right, of like maps and culpability, right, GPS, WGS, we can keep going, but the one that's been on my mind a lot is EPSG, and uh, yesterday, um, I mentioned to a few people here that I was like, I kind of want to talk about EPSG, and they all kind of made the same like resigned solidarity, the wow, we really fucked up grimace that I guess I think of as like the face of 2019. Um, <laughs> kind of along lines of just like, yeah, <sighs> oh, we did that, right? Um, and we did, we did that. Um, I suspect this is an audience that, that doesn't need this explained, um, but for the sake of posterity and because it's being filmed, I'm just gonna you know, explain that EPSG um, stands for European Petroleum Survey Group. It was a body that was formed in the 1980s of surveying and cartography experts uh, working on oil exploration for large companies who created standards used for mapping. Um, and they were, in 2005, folded into the International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. The EPSG geodetic parameter data set uh, is kind of, you know, remains the standards body for like ellipsoids and coordinate systems, basically like ways of visualizing maps. You may remember their previous work in 2008 of grudgingly adding Web Mercator to the standards, um, adding to yet more labels for Web Mercator. If you've ever been like, why is there like a 900, like 913 and a 3857, like that's kind of part of why. <laughs> um, they also like are very snotty in their depiction of their like, it's not a real coordinate system. Um, to be fair, Web Mercator's bad. Um, but I, I mention this because I don't know, there's something, there's sort of like a weird kind of mournful irony to me to the fact that like, there is kind of more and more need for work on things like crisis mapping and more and more need for kind of maps to plan for like resiliency for communities and sort of the de facto methods in GIS for visualizing <laughs> crises and, and spaces that need to be made more resilient were designed and kind of standardized by a body of people whose profession basically exacerbated that crisis, right? Um, it's sort of something, I don't know, I wouldn't kind of stand here and tell anyone like, don't use EPSG any more than I would tell you like, don't drive on freeways. Like that's not strategic, that's not really the point. Um, also like then you, like what do you get? Like Web Mercator and Molloide? Like, I didn't, um, didn't land, okay. Um, <laughs> But I think there is something about um, when something becomes an infrastructure, part of its power lies in the fact that it becomes increasingly inconvenient and difficult to imagine and outside of it, right? Like to, to try and kind of like do something else becomes harder and harder. Um, and not taking things for granted isn't necessarily the same as, as celebrating those things. Um, it's also about learning to sit with and see things for all of their messiness and complicity and being honest about what you can and actually can actually do about it and and working through like the discomfort of change because i think there if there are things that kind of we all kind of go like oh that's too bad what do we do it's like yeah what what we do is we like you know look at it and you know there's it's like hard work to kind of think about what to do but i think that it's necessarily so um, i also you know, not taking things for granted is also about recognizing that um, a lot of these systems aren't as built to last or as inevitable as they can appear from a distance. I, um, I couldn't decide whether to put up the Percy Shelley poem, Ozymandias, or the uh, Smash Mouth song, All Star. Luckily for me, Ranjit uh, rewrote All Star to, to be the poem Ozymandias. Um, that joke is for like one person in this room. <laughs> Um, so terraforming, as it is depicted in science fiction, is um, generally about the fantasy of making a place more inhabitable for someone or something without having to feel bad about doing that in a way that ultimately makes it uninhabitable for whatever life was already there. It allows the illusion that like nothing was here before, right? Um, and when one looks at terraforming as the thing that humans do and always has done on Earth, things sort of get a lot messier. Um, 
This is a, I went to an electronics recycling trade show a few years ago and this uh, metal shredding company had a booth with the slogan, the future is here and everything needs to be destroyed. <laughs> Don't fall behind the times. Um, and this, this is, I, I, I was like, that's the most 2016 and everything since sentiment I've, I've ever heard. Um, and right now, I, I kind of believe that the two things that are sort of most shaping the future um, are unpredictable ecological collapse and the expansion of globally networked technological systems. Um, and they are occasionally talked about as being part of the same problem and as being legacies of the same problems, but not necessarily with a great deal of urgency because to say that the internet is an environmental disaster uh, requires undoing a lot of things and making a lot of people very uncomfortable. Um, maps and infrastructure sit at a really interesting and potentially really powerful cross-section between those two emergent trends. And I am still honestly trying to figure out how I want to use that cross-section. I am really heartened by a lot of the ways that OpenStreetMappers navigate it. Um, and I think ultimately what for me has been important for thinking through it is starting with just not taking anything for granted. Um, thank you so much for your time. I'm not gonna be taking questions, but I'll be around for the rest of the day. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>